Well, I was absolutely terrified when I saw my name on the agenda for the marketing and branding session. <laughs> because I don't know anything about marketing and branding. I'm kind of a research and crop production person. But I thought, well, if I don't know anything about marketing and branding, I guess what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit from my own experiences and maybe try and give you some information that will help you all with your marketing and branding. Because I think almost all of you in this room know more about marketing and branding than I do. So, I live in Anacortes, Washington, which is a little town on Fidelgo Island. It's connected by a bridge to the mainland. And there are a ton of people that go through Fidelgo Island on their way to their summer vacations. Some of them go on the way to the ferries to go out to the San Juan Islands. And some of them go to Fidelgo Island to go to the marinas there and, and get into boats and go on vacations that way. And the one thing that they all have in common is they all buy a lot of strawberries. Um, you know, when people are on vacation, they like to get something a little special. They like to splurge. And so if you go up and down the main drag in Anacortes, you see all these strawberry stands. Lots of the berry growers in Skagit Valley have a little strawberry stand here and there, all up and down the way. If you go into the, uh, the main grocery store, Richard's got a lot of strawberries there. Um, there's a tremendous amount of strawberries that go, fresh market strawberries that go out the door in Anacortes. And I go to the grocery store, I have the strawberry stands a lot. I like to eat, so I I hang around those places, and I'm shocked sometimes. I'll see people walk right past some beautiful um, local strawberries that were picked this morning, and they'll go into the store and they'll pick some organics out of Watsonville, I reckon, at that time of year. Um, and the Watsonville berries are nice, but they were probably picked four days ago, um, and they, they just bypassed you know, a wonderful local product why? Because they wanted to buy something that was organic. So, if you're going to market your strawberries locally, and you want to get an edge, and if you can possibly do organics, that can help provide you a really significant edge. It might be, not be as much of a factor as Alf as you have, when you have a one-to-one -one connection with your customers, and they know you, and they trust you. But in an environment like <coughs> All the strawberry stands and Anacort is where lots of people's strawberries are picking one against another. It's something that can help you stand out. So, that gets me to where maybe I can offer you something. Is I thought I would tell some a few things about, in my experience, with a few years of doing organic strawberry day neutrals, what are some of the things that you could expect if you try to do organics and if you have experience as a conventional grower, what are some of the bumps in the road that you're likely to see? Um, I already talked a little bit earlier about plug plants, so I guess I won't beat that into the ground anymore. The UC varieties, Tom Bauman mentioned that, and um, he didn't mention much about seascape, but we've had good luck with seascape as well. So Albion, and San Andreas, and seascape are our, really, we're our mainstays in our little plots. Beautiful, beautiful fruit. Uh, it's high quality, and, uh, and the yields are really there. You know, in that particular year, that's about three quarters of a pound of fruit per plant. In other years, with plugs, we've done a pound of fruit per plant. And I would imagine that in the nicer climate that you all have down here, you could do better. So you can do perfectly good yields in an organic system if you feed them adequately, if you water them adequately. Uh, we talked about tunnels and that. Um, fertilizing through the drip, you know, if you're doing an organic system or a conventional system for day neutrals, um, you've got to fertigate them very frequently. Um, you know, we did our fertigations moderately frequently, about once a week, um, and we did about three and a half pounds of nitrogen per acre, and uh, we did about the same amount of potassium as well. Strawberries remove a lot of potassium. And we were able to do this with organic fertilizers just fine. Um, but your organic fertilizers will cost a lot more than your conventional fertilizers. 
Tom Bauman already talked about the importance of calcium. He is absolutely right. We tried it the first year without supplemental calcium, and we had all those pump and leaf symptoms that you saw earlier. But the one thing that might be a big surprise, if you're already a grower who uses drip on, con on conventional strawberries and you move over to organics, you're going to be really surprised by how often you have to flush the lines. Because those fertilizers, the organic fertilizers, work great, but a lot of them are really thick, they're really good at plugging emitters in lines. And so it was essential for us to flush the lines after every fertigation in the organic um, systems. So we would go out there, we'd fertigate, and then before we were done fertigating, well, after we were done fertigating, we'd run a half hour of fresh water through the lines, and then we'd flush all the lines before we shut the irrigation system down. If you don't do that, um, sure enough, some of those organic fertilizers will plug up your emitters, and then you're really stuck, because you've got plugged emitters under the drip, under the, uh, the plastic mulch. Uh, Verticillium wilt, I mentioned this earlier this morning, but I think it bears uh, mentioning again. Because if you're organic, um, you probably don't, well, you don't have uh, fumigation as an option now. There is um, a company with uh, mustard oil that's available now, and they, they say they think they're going to get it Omri certified, but it's not available yet. Um, so you have to do other measures, uh, pre-plant on strawberries. Um, so you have to watch out for verticillium wilt. It has a very broad host range. Don't follow potatoes, don't follow lettuce. Um, and strawberries are a lot more susceptible than most things. So it's, you know, in the Skagit Valley, we grow a lot of potatoes, right? And one of the most common problems that strawberry growers have is they, they follow potatoes and they, that potatoes look great. Potatoes didn't show any symptoms of verticillium. Well, of course they don't. Potatoes can tolerate, like, 100 sclerotia per gram of soil before they show symptoms. Well, some strawberry varieties can tolerate two sclerotia per gram of soil before they show symptoms. So the potatoes look great. We put the strawberries in, the strawberries just all went down for silly. So that's something to really watch for in the organic system. Be very, very careful about what was in the field before and was it a verticillium host. Um, I think these are your photos. They're at least a lower one, isn't it, Wendy? <coughs> um, Lygus bugs and slugs are, were a big problem in our organic production. Um, we used a lot of sluggo. Whoops, sorry. We used a lot of sluggo in our organic production, and it, it worked pretty well. What worked just as well, in addition to that, was to clean cultivate around the beds. We had, in our first year, done. Uh, um, cover crop to try and build soil in the alleyways around the beds, but those uh, cover crops provide a great harbor for slugs. The slugs go into the cover crops and then they come out and then eat the strawberries. So you want to clean cultivation with the organics. Um, Lygus bugs are also a real common problem. There's in Wendy's picture here, you can see some of the fruit that's misshapen, likely from Lygus bugs. For that, um, you want to keep a safe distance from brassica crops and consider a trap crop. Um, there's a really excellent UC publication on lagus bugs if this is something you encounter in your own strawberry growing. That's about all I've got. Are there any questions? Yes? I guess this question is for everyone. Do you have, uh, what do you do for um, bowl? Are bold problems really common in uh, our rodents? Are bold Well, or rodents? Let's say rodents. Yeah. I've had I've had rodent problems, and um, we used to clean cultivation, and we didn't see it as much after that. But I think in a plastic culture system, it can be a hazard. I don't know what baits are allowed for an organic system, what you can do for baits. In the conventional system, you need a lot of good baits. So organics are going to come. There's no kind of phosphate organics, man, so I don't know. <laughs> well, this would be for any system. 
I just want to tell you, uh, I went to the Caneberry uh, sessions in Monterey, California, and uh, I don't know what possessed me, I went to the organic uh, session, uh, and uh, I was listening to that, and there were a lot of long-haired, uh, ponytail people uh, in there, uh, and uh, I'm looking at this and I'm going, I'm certainly in the most wrong uh, session that there is, but I stayed on with it. And there were two guys that came up, they have thousands of acres all across the United States, and they're uh, managing their organic farm completely like a commercial farm. There's nothing about a lifestyle in that at all, and they're very, very successful, so I can only encourage you to, uh, to do something like that. If it's a lifestyle, forget it. But if, it's, if you really want to have it as a business, uh, it, it's a possibility to do it. And there are quite a few uh, commercial guides online, and UC Davis has uh, created a few of them too, uh, production guides, I think even one for uh, strawberries. Uh, I, I know there's one out for strawberries, uh, but, and I think it's UC Davis that has created it. But treat it as a business, a real business. Treat it um, uh, with respect uh, to what varieties to grow, pick the ones that are uh, the least susceptible to the diseases, like the prevention thing, and try to keep up the resistance of the plants, keep the plants happy, uh, they will be able to fight off a whole bunch of diseases by themselves, uh, as is the mantra of the organic growers. And if I could just add a comment to another Tom comment. Uh, that our, our processors and packers around here are really kind of encouraging people and looking for any kind of um, source of organic materials at this point, products, because there is market demand. But And uh, we're hoping to do some more work on this, but it is just, and you guys can speak to this too, I'm sure our buyers will speak to it, but it's such a huge risk here in our wetter climates and how we get around this bottleneck of controlling the, the fungal diseases, I'd say it's probably one of our major, major issues. Um, <coughs> If you have an extra $12,000 an acre to throw in tunnels, it's easy. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> is that what tunnels cost, basically? As far I, I think that's roughly what you know, it would be like a per acre cost some years ago. So it's, it tends to depend a lot on the price of energy. So the price of energy has been low lately. So maybe it's not any higher than that. You know, your first example, though, of someone picking Driscoll's organic in a store over local that's not labeled organic. <coughs> it, that's a really tough branding marketing thing to get around because the, environmentally those local ones will probably overbalance whatever's been used. Well, it depends. I shouldn't go that far, but um, it's a lot easier to grow organic strawberries under that systems that they've got down in California in those schools than it is up here. It is. It is a lot easier. And, and maybe, you know, up here, maybe it's 
it's not realistic to do it in the open field in June. <coughs> but maybe it is realistic to do it in the open field in August and September when you know, the bulk of the game <coughs> is coming. Yeah, I think we've got to really work on that. 